Just a breath away It's silent spaces in the rain It's when you finally hear him say I am with you I am with you One. Good people of Nexus, greetings and salutations. And hello to the people of Avon Mennonite Church. If you're confused, that's good. Because today, I'm sitting down with my brother, the Right Honorable Reverend Bradley Watson, for a conversation about confusion. And there's a lot to be confused about in the world these days. There's a lot of different things we could discuss, but I thought, Bradley, we would start by wading into the water slowly and gently instead of diving right into the deep end. So let's start with your confusion as a Maple Leafs fan. Now, just providing some context mm -hmm. for those of you not into hockey, we're in the middle of the playoffs in September here, which is odd, but isn't everything this year. And the Toronto Maple Leafs were eliminated in the qualifying round. They didn't even make it to round one. And that's been particularly hard on my dear brother Brad. How are you doing? How are you feeling? Confused. Because A, you told me we were both wearing hats. Yes, uh, yes, there was some you, hat talk. You, you sound like you're not a Leafs fan yourself, but... That's in my past. Uh, yeah. That, <laughs> okay. To the Leafs question, I mean, I was on the verge of where you are. Giving up. Throwing the towel in. But the night they went out amidst the anger, the frustration, humiliation, had a moment where I just I needed peace and so I asked for peace and the next moment 
or morning, I woke up and uh, I felt better. I felt like a burden had been taken off my shoulder. And um, since then, what I've realized is that I just needed to let it go in order to see the blessings. Hmm. And the blessings to me are this. First of all, it's a great reminder to me that hope is hard to kill because I'm already excited about next season. I mean, I don't know if you've seen the moves we're making. Hmm. I think next year is the year. So hope is hard to kill. But I've also been reminded that grace is everywhere. There's gifts everywhere. I mean, it was one thing for the Leafs to go out, but to see the Bruins and Habs move on and then go out early. Oh, what a gift. <laughs> what a gift. Oh, I love it. So there is still grace to be found everywhere. Habs are out. Bruins are out. The universe has just righted itself. So you, you mentioned optimism and hope. And I, I recently heard a, a rabbi distinguish those two terms. He said optimism is thinking things are going to be okay or even get better. Hope is acknowledging things are not going to be okay. They might even get worse. Mm. But there is meaning underneath it all. So hope is the trust that there is meaning. No matter what situation or circumstance you find yourself in, there is an underlying meaning. Now, I heard some optimism about the Leafs next season. <laughs> yes. What about hope? Have you actually discerned meaning in your journey as a Toronto Maple Leafs fan? Well, I, I, I wish you hadn't mentioned the rabbi there because now I'm in a bit of trouble because... I don't know what the meaning is in having spent hours, a lot of hours this season watching that. But in, in many ways, it was a bonding experience and allowed me the joy, I suppose, of watching the Habs and Bruins go out. So, well, there you go. You it know, provided that occasion that, for joy. They did. And so did the Leafs many times. I was very excited. I heard about uh, that big comeback or something. <laughs> Yeah, like you weren't there, excited <laughs> like the rest of us. It was almost a miracle. It was. And then it, uh, well, anyway, yeah. we're, we're back to yeah. hope. There, okay. there must be meaning somewhere in there. But let's move on. Right now, you're still in a stage of confusion, maybe, as a Leafs fan, as am I. Yeah. Full disclosure. Yeah. Well, I want to switch gears and talk about church. And there's actually a lot of parallels between the Toronto Maple Leafs and church these days, as far as I'm concerned. But... A lot of people are confused about what does it mean to be church, given our current situation with the, the COVID-19 pandemic. How do we be and do church without buildings, without programs, without getting together in person to worship? Do you have some thoughts? Yeah, I mean, first, to be honest, I think I, I don't know. I don't know if anyone knows. Um, I'm very confused about all of this. The other pastors I talk to seem to be saying the same thing. And I mean, when this first happened, churches reacted by moving online. Uh, that was all any of us could do. Now, whether that's sustainable in the future, if there's a price tag to that, I really don't know. But questions around the future, putting that aside for a second, a few things, two things, I think. First, I think we need to just be honest about what we've lost in all of this. This is not ideal. Um, this is not what church should be or could be, but for now, what else can we do? And so this is the reality. We're trying to make the best of a rotten situation, you could say. And I've been thinking around that a lot. I have uh, thoughts around the exile in scripture and how that theme plays out a lot. Um, and the Hebrew people and their constant journeys through exile. And of course, the famous exile, they're carted off to Babylon. Persia takes mm -hmm. over. They're living in exile. They're there for 50 years, a good 50 years, when word finally comes, hey, you can go home. And so they head back and they're trying to rebuild what was lost. They return home, begin rebuilding the temple. And of course, they don't have the money. They don't have the ability to build it back to its former glory, but they lay the foundation of this new temple. And we read this in Ezra 3, and I think it's interesting to me. It says this, when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments and with trumpets and the Levites with cymbals took their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. 
With praise and thanksgiving they sang to the Lord, He is good, His love toward Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid. I mean, this feels a bit to me like the situation we're in. The priests and family heads, they look at this new temple being built, and they weep because they've seen, they know the yeah. splendor of what the temple could have been, has yep. been. And they're looking at the foundation and the blueprints, and they're devastated. It's half the size. They're making budget cuts. It's not going to be all of its bells and whistles it had before. And sure, it will do, but they take time to weep about that. And I think it's the same thing for us right now. I think we just need to honestly reckon with the reality we're in. This is not ideal. This is not how it should be. And uh, I think when we do that, we allow ourselves to see ourselves in a period of exile mm. and allow ourselves to mourn a bit about what we've lost and give ourselves permission to say, hey, this is not ideal. We'll work within the limitations that we have, but let's not pretend this is great. Um, second, though, if I can jump ahead here, the period um, I was thinking about that we're going to need is um, I was thinking a lot about how in this period where we can't be with our communities, we're all going to have to walk alone a little mm -hmm. bit more. Yeah nurture our own spiritualities. <clears throat> I like to think of the church, of course, as this traveling company that we walk Jesus' path with, and suddenly, with not being able to meet, or in the same way, um, we've lost our travel company. COVID has robbed us of that. We're suddenly walking more alone, it would seem. We no longer have that company. So what do you do? This got me thinking about a hike that you and I went on. I don't know if you remember it. We, we climbed Angel's Landing in Zion National Park, just absolutely gorgeous, but there were ominous warning signs from the get-go. There was. Announcements as we're getting on the bus. Two people had died in the previous two weeks hiking this thing, and there were storms coming in, and yet we're brave souls. We carry on. We move on, and so we hike this, and we get to the last turnaround point. One of our brothers He's not going to go any farther. We carry on, myself, you, our other brother, Mike. We're almost at the top when a blizzard comes in. And it's I crazy. remember very vividly you saying, I think we should turn around. Yes. And I, I, I'm not sure if I actually put you on my shoulders, but I remember <laughs> saying, no, we can do this, guys. We can do this. And we got to the top, and it was just this magical experience. And we're coming down, hiking down this steep trail, steep precipice, and all of a sudden, now, I don't know what got into you, um, but all of a sudden, you took off running. It was the strangest thing I've ever seen because it wasn't, nobody runs on this trail. It's dangerous. It's very steep. And you took off running. And it wasn't just a run. It was the way you were running. It was with a glee. It, was, it had this, you know, and you had this smile on your face. And it was weird. Inexplicably, uh, Mike and Scott, they followed you. They took off running. And so did some other band. Some random guy on the trail saw you running past and was like, yep, I guess that's what we're doing. And it was just this bizarre experience. And listen, I don't mind owning it. Um, I'm not of the caliber you are in in terms of steep trail running. Uh, I don't do the, 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 what, the CrossFit. Uh, is that what you call it? Yeah. The CrossFit thingy. And uh, so there I am. You take off. And I'm alone on the trail. I've lost my traveling companions. Hmm. And I remember in that moment thinking, so what do, what do you do? Do you just stop? Do you just wait? No, you keep walking. And uh, I think to me that's uh, a bit of a metaphor for the times we're in. We're all a little bit more alone right now. We've lost our travel company. But it doesn't mean we stop following the Jesus path. We might be alone but we keep walking, mm. we keep going, and let's hope in the near future we can be back together again. Wow, there's a lot there. That reminds me, I came across this a few weeks ago. It was uh, two characters walking down a path, 
And one of the characters says to the other, what's more important, the journey or the destination? Hmm. The other character says, the company. <laughs> and there's, there's something innate within us as human beings. We want to journey with others. Yeah. We want to travel. But not just anyone. We want good company. Good company. And a part of me has been, I'm often contemplating the, the decline and demise of the church in North yeah. America. Part of me wonders, have we not been good company to <laughs> certain good. kinds of people and an increasing number of people? I think that's a part of it. And Jesus was good company. People loved to be around him, except for uber-religious people. Hmm. Everyone else actually thought he was good company. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. And so I've been contemplating this question, what does it mean for us as churches to be good company for people to travel through life with, for more and more people? And I don't have any answers, but that's just been something that, that I've been kind of ruminating, because I think that the churches that are going to make it through this are the, the churches that they're good company with one another. Mm -hmm. They know how to do relationships. And that's, yeah, that's, that's not easy. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. or if No, I, I love that. I've never heard of that before, but I think that's, that drives home. That's incredibly important. What kind of company are we? Nobody wants to travel we all have horror travel stories of people we would rather not have spent our time with. And I think that's a great observation. We need to spend more time thinking about what kind of company are we? The, yeah. And I realize the word company is confusing because you're not the kind of institutional, <laughs> institutional corporation. Right. You want to be, but the right. Actual kind of, anyway, the, the next question, because as I've been, pondering on the confusion of what it means to be the church. In the midst of the confusion, sometimes I like to simplify things and find the simplest forms midst the complexities. Yeah. And the issues of church are very complex. But what is the simplest form of church? What, if you had to boil it down to the three or four essential ingredients, mm -hmm. What would those ingredients be? And like when I think of baking bread, and I don't bake a lot of bread, do you? <laughs> no, I don't. But I've heard it's a, it's some work. It's yeah. It's fairly labor intensive. And I read on the internet, because I have never baked bread, you know, to be honest with you, but the essential ingredients, there's a lot of optional ingredients, but the essential ingredients are you need flour, you need yeast, you need some kind of liquid, and you need salt. Mm. You know? I've talked to some people and they've debated me on whether salt is an essential ingredient. I don't know. Huh. But to use the analogy, what would the, the few essential ingredients be that you would mix up in this bowl and it would become the church? And then I started thinking about this analogy further and I realized you could have all those ingredients. You, know, you have your, your water, your flour, your yeast, your salt. You mix them up, but you still don't have bread. Mm. There has to be a chemical reaction called right. cooking. Cooking is actually... It's a chemical transformation, a substantial transformation. So, and by that I mean changing the substance of what is. And for me in that analogy, divine spirit is the, the, the cooking agent, mm. the, that, that chemical transformation that takes a group of people like you and I yeah. and, and transforms us into the body of Christ, into a Christ community. So those are some of my thoughts. I have a lot more on that subject, yeah. but I want to turn it over to you and just get your thoughts on simple church, the, the, the essential ingredients of, of what might make a, a group of people a hmm. church. Yeah, I'm curious about that, that, that spark, that ignition, chemical reaction thing. I mean, it's interesting because right now a lot of people are wondering exactly that. What, what is church? And you know, when you take away things due to COVID, like singing together, uh, how do we do communion, Eucharist, whatever you call it? How do we do that? Is that essential? Um, I think what we're learning is that we can actually do and be church without some of those things. Some people love singing, worshiping together. Fair enough. Is that essential? I don't know. Um, Eucharist, communion, that one feels tougher to me. But for me, when I break it down, 
I think the, in, the, the essential ingredients that make church, in my mind, are simple. Um, a community of people who are willing to explore, travel, and follow the Jesus path. And so I think as long as you have the path and you have people, now I'm intrigued by this chemical reaction thing here, but I think if you've got people in the path, you're doing church. And all these other things, I think, then become expressions of how a specific community chooses to travel the path together. It's an expression of how they travel. Um, and so some churches, they love to sing. Sing so, you know, six songs every morning, chorus a couple times. They do communion, Eucharist every single Sunday. Okay, other churches, you know, singing. Maybe they do Eucharist sparingly. Um, in essence, though, I think whatever's happening right now, even behind ca uh, cameras, in essence, I still think we're doing church. We still teach and try to practice the Christian way. There are still people somewhere out there behind computers. So for now, the walk is a bit more of a solo expedition, but I still think we're doing church. But there's one catch to me. With only being able to meet online, uh, we're not able to share life with each other in the flesh. And I think we run the risk of losing something core about church without that. I think I see it this way. In this world, on social media, on our own, I think it's easy to think that we can love justice and love the whole world, so to speak. We can be on board for all the right causes, check all the right boxes, all the right things we're working and supporting. But in my mind, while that's good, it's too, it's too easy, in a sense. Because I think church, the local church, is God's big school of love that won't allow us to just love from a distance. It's like you take church, whether it's 150 people, 100, 200, whatever it is, it becomes a laboratory of love. It's like, okay, if you're serious about the Jesus path and about being people of love and forgiveness and grace and justice, can you practice those things with just these 150 people? Can you work for justice? You can get overwhelmed with all that needs to happen in the world. Can you make it happen with just this 150 people? Can you work for peace and get along with just this 150 group of people? That is incredibly hard. And um, you might, you know, when I think about church context, where the rubber meets the road is you might have some guy in your church on social media posting about how all lives matter. In that same community, you might have people very passionate about Black Lives Matter. And it's like, wow, how do you make that work? And so you might have someone working, you know, someone who's conservative, sipping coffee with someone who votes NDP. You might have somebody who holds to a traditional sexual ethics sitting right beside someone from the LGBTQ community. And it's like all of these things, pro-life, pro-choice, how do we make that work Take all of those tensions and make it work in that little community, whatever the number is, right? Um, because what I think church does is takes the universal ideas of the Christian path and makes it intensely local, puts you in a schoolroom, a classroom, and says, practice those here. And so to me, in doing that, church is two things for me. First, it's the most exciting, beautiful, I think world-changing endeavor a person can belong to. Uh, I still, perhaps naively, believe church is the hope of the world. I do believe that. But second, it makes it really hard. It's hard to be a part of because humans are difficult and stubborn and quirky. And then you get some people who are toxic and they're manipulative. And, and others of us, like you and I, we can be just annoying and hard to get along with sometimes, you know? So... Uh, it's, it's a tough mix, but to me, as long as you have the core of Jesus' path, following that, and a group of people willing to come along, you have church. Um, and we're being robbed of that right now in some ways, but we work with what we have. I like that. Laboratories of love. Mm. That resonates, and it is hard. It's very easy to love everyone. Mm. That's very <laughs> easy to live, to love someone in particular. To love 150 people in particular, that, that is challenging. Um, to love in principle, in theory, that, that's easy. Yeah. Uh, I'm very good at that. 
<laughs> yeah. loving actual annoying human beings that, mm. that it is a laboratory it yeah is, it is something that we are invited to practice it is a spiritual practice and it is a discipline mm. and um what reminds me of stanley Hauerwas. i want to talk about this when thinking of the essence of the church stanley Hauerwas said this the work of Jesus was not a new set of ideals or principles for reforming or even revolutionizing society, but the establishment of a new community, a people that embodied forgiveness, sharing, and self-sacrificial love in its rituals and discipline. In that sense, the visible church is not to be the bearer of Christ's message. The church is to be the message. Huh. So the good news isn't something we proclaim and tell people that we're supposed to be the good news mm. of what love looks like, of what of authentic, genuine community looks like, because that's what true community is love. And I think that's hard to do in a group of 500 people. Yeah. I think maybe even 150 people is tough. Um, but even small groups, I'm not sure how many small groups would qualify as authentic, genuine community. I mean, right. M. Scott Peck says... Most groups are pseudo-community hmm. uh, about keeping the peace and agreeing to disagree and, and, and all, upholding all the social niceties that, right. that we have fallen prey to. I'm not sure hmm. if that's a good terminology, but <laughs> that's what I'm going to use. Where true community is about love. Hmm. Now, what is love? And I love where the definition that M. Scott Peck gives love, you probably know it. Oh, yes. And to me, it's just Yes, this is what it's about. So he defines love as the will. And right, right away, I'm like, yeah, it, it's a matter of the yeah. will. It, is, <laughs> it takes a lot of willpower and discipline to love. The will to extend oneself for the purpose of nurturing one's own or another's spiritual growth. Mm. So love is about spiritual growth. That means the purpose and essence of church is about spiritual growth. Now... To be authentic community means we are going to grow. Mm. And I have, I have many, many questions about that. I mean, how many people are connected with the church because they want to grow? <laughs> and Interesting. Like I think of a, the common example that people use when they talk about authentic and genuine community is a 12-step program. People come together, there's authenticity, there is humility, there's vulnerability, there's honesty. They're, they're real about the fact that they need to change, mm. that they need to be transformed, that they need to grow. And, and the whole purpose of coming together is to grow, to be changed, to be transformed. And in that environment, you have the closest thing that, that I can think of to true community to genuine community. Then you have the church, and there's a lot of, yeah, a lot of us are connecting for many different reasons, and I'm, and I'm not that that's wrong. Right. I mean, I think of the one in Fight Club, the, the main character kept joining all these support groups. <laughs> not, not to grow, not to be transformed, not to change, but to the intimacy. You know, right. Experience of intimacy, and that's not wrong. There's, there's many good things and good reasons that we would want to connect with other people in the context of church. But I really think if that desire to grow and be transformed by my relationships with all these other people isn't there, I'm not sure that that group of people can be the ecclesia, the, the, the Christ community that Jesus has called us to be. When Jesus encounters people, I see a pattern that he is basically asking them all the same question. Are you willing to change? Hmm. Are you willing to be changed? Are you willing to be transformed? And, and I think that is an essential ingredient in the church. If we, if we have a group of people coming together and half of us aren't willing to be changed, I don't know how we can be the church that Jesus had in mind. Yeah. I don't know if you have some thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I mean, that <laughs> community, it, church communities attract people for so many different reasons. Um, and... Um, you know, I want to meet people where they are, 
right? Like you want to, you know, if somebody's looking for that intimacy, okay, that's a place to start, right? But absolutely, you hope that people come to a place, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, there's a great line on, on, on spiritual growth. Hopefully you don't have to edit this out. But I think it's um, spiritual growth is becoming less of a Mennonite edit. And to me, that is the constant. Do, do you actually want to change? Do you want to be a better person? Um, if that's not there, then I don't know what we're doing. The whole church thing. I really don't. I mean, I get... There's some connection intimacy pieces, but um, you can find that elsewhere, I think. Um, anyway. Yeah. The, um, yeah, there's so many places we could go right now, but to, to bring it back to spiritual growth, let's get personal. Mm. So we're, we're talking about confusion. This is, uh, what are we calling this? Two brothers, two pastors. <laughs> Conf one confusing conversation about confusion. Right. So, and I think we're doing that. I think we're being quite confusing. So I think we're, <laughs> I think, I think we're nailing. We're nailing. But <laughs> what is confusing you most these days? Oh, and how is that helping or hindering your spiritual growth? I mean, that's two questions. Answer yeah. one. Or... I, I think like a lot of people, everything's confusing. I mean, we're, we're, we're living through multiple crises right now. We've got a global health crisis. We've got a racial justice crisis. I think we have an economic crisis, although maybe we haven't experienced the hardships of that in its totality yet. Um, that doesn't even speak to whatever's happening in, in my life or anybody else's life. Um, and I think my biggest source of confusion right now is how to be a pastor, how to lead well in all of this. Um, and I'm not quite sure. I think a conversation like this is a good place to start. Acknowledging the confusion, yes. maybe even embracing it a little bit. Um, that would be my big one. I think uh, normally I get really excited about the fall, and I am excited, but it's a very different kind of excitement this year. Yeah, for sure. I don't know. I don't know what this year is going to bring. So, you? Well, you, you were talking. Of, you were talking about in another conversation about historically, Christians have always gone to the. Yeah. And, and I've been reading a book on that that's quite famous and infamous. Yeah. And, and, and yet that's a confusing premise. Yeah. Given our current situation, we would stay away. Right. And yeah, talk about it. It's like we've been robbed of any anchor points we might find in our own tradition. And so it, it, it feels like we're, we're, we really are unprecedented because we look back to our ancestors in the faith and it was on the front lines, help those who are sick, die in the process. Of, now, of course, they didn't realize the way diseases, viruses spread. And so now that thought of just isolate is, that's just incredibly difficult. Um, but what, what else can we do? Yeah, there's, these really are confusing times on so many levels. Um, people who aren't confused right now, really confused. <laughs> and yeah, the more I've been thinking about this, this confusion, I realized confusion isn't a bad thing. Hmm. I mean, confusion is just coming to the awareness that you don't understand. You don't know. You are unclear on things. Not only is that not a bad thing, it's actually essential to spiritual growth. Because when you are confused, you are becoming aware that you need to recalibrate your perspective and the way you think about things, the world, yourself, reality. Confusion is really being invited to let go of what used to make sense. Huh. An example, when you're watching a movie, and you've probably watched a movie with someone like this. Uh, I'm not going to name our mom, but uh, <laughs> you're watching the movie, and there's this character who is a who's seems like a protagonist and just a wonderful. And then all of a sudden, a plot twist happens, and they turn out to be the bad guy, the killer, or the spy, or whatever. And and then this person's like, "Wait, wait, they're confused. What happened? I thought he was one of the good guys. You've been in this situation. Hey, what and, happened? Hey, what happened? Exactly." 
And in that moment, what you, you're confused because you need to let go of what used to make sense. What mm. used to make sense was this is one of the good guys, one of the protagonists. But, mm. but new information, something has happened, and that doesn't make sense anymore. So confusion is just that invitation, becoming aware that what used to make sense doesn't anymore. Mm. And why that's critical to spiritual growth is, is spiritual growth is, if I understand Jesus' teachings correctly, is, is more about subtraction than addition. It's not about doing more things or becoming more. It's about letting things go, letting go of your assumptions, the things that, that you have come to believe are important and essential. Letting go of that, the image of self, all of that stuff, to get down to the, the essence of who you are. That's the, the big part of spiritual growth. Letting go so you can really discover and manifest your true self. That, that's how I look at spiritual growth. And confusion is really a gateway to wisdom. That's another way of looking at it. Socrates, this is my interpretation, but he says wisdom is directly proportional to your awareness of your own ignorance. <laughs> so Becoming aware that you don't know, becoming aware that you don't understand, becoming aware that, that you are ignorant, that is wisdom. Mm. That is beautiful. I love that. Now, I've always been drawn to the, the wisdom books in the Bible. And Ecclesiastes is probably my favorite book. Mm. has been for, for many years. And uh, I've been spending some time in Ecclesiastes again. And talk about a confusing book. <laughs> it's pretty confusing, but it's also full of existential insight and depths and it's just it's right up my alley as you know that's I really enjoy things like that well there's so much I want to say about Ecclesiastes but this has probably already been long enough so I, I sh I'm gonna be short and one of the most famous passages in Ecclesiastes most people know this songs have been written about it you know there's a time and a season uh, yeah. for everything yeah and the, the teacher in Ecclesiastes says there is a, a time and a season for building up, and there's a time and a season for tearing down. And right now, it seems as church, as society, civilization, we are in a season of tearing down, of deconstruction. Mm. And that's okay. This is the season for it. Now, there's a season for building up coming. I mean, you, you, I, I have some friends who have just kind of set up camp in the deconstruction <laughs> space. And... You, I don't think that's healthy, and I don't think it's living in truth. There are many different seasons and times, and, and you've, got to, you've got to move with the times. But there is definitely a time and a season for deconstruction and tearing down, and I think we're in one right now. I think you'd yeah. agree. Yeah. Well, the, the teacher also says there is a, a time for embracing, and there's a time to refrain from embracing. <laughs> well, again, we are in a season where we need to re refrain from embracing. Yeah. And that is absolutely, the huggers in our midst are losing their minds. You know, it's been tough on them. Now, I'm not, I've been kind of enjoying it. You know, I, I'm yeah, kind of a, both, I know. physical distance is uh, finally, sort of, that's, that's where, but, our time, our season. Exactly, it's our season. But, but the huggers in our midst, this has been hard on mm -hmm. them, but, mm -hmm. but there, is, there is a time. There is a season for refraining to, and what the teacher is saying is not only that the, there's a season where it's inappropriate to not hug and embrace, but there's actually meaning in this season. Mm. It's important. This season is actually important. There is meaning here to be found. That's what, that's what the teacher is talking about. So we, when he goes on to say there's a, there's a time to, to laugh and there's a time to weep. Both are important. There's a time to dance and there's a time to mourn. Mm. Both are important. There's meaning in both. Now, some of us resist the dancing and the celebration. Some of us resist the mourning and the weeping. And we do, either one, we do so at our own peril because both are important in their own time, in the right time and season. Both are important and both have meaning. Some people just want to dance their way through every season and every time. <laughs> and that just doesn't work. That's not healthy. There is a time to stop dancing and celebrating and mourn. To just dance through life it's not healthy, it's not, it's not appropriate, and it's not living in truth. Yeah. It's not being in the truth of the moment. Same as weeping. Some people want to weep their way through life. Yeah. And, you know, there is a time and a season, but there's also a time 
in a season when you need to start dancing and mm. celebrating. Because it's not all about you. It's, it's about adjusting to the season that you are in. That is key. That is the wisdom here, is to be able to discern the time and season you're in and adjust to it. Mm. A good friend of mine a couple days ago said, you've got to find the right gear. <laughs> in life, it's about finding the right gear. We were talking about mountain biking. One of my sons is really, really into mountain biking now. So he has dragged me out to a bit of a crazy place, the Hydro Cut. You've yes, been there. Yes. And there are some pretty intense, <laughs> insane <laughs> courses that for me, he enjoys them all. Um, one, I just finally said, no, kamikaze. I don't know oh. if you've been on that. He went yes. down and I'm like, no, I'm putting my foot down. I'm not yeah. going down that one. But, but going on these different mountain biking courses, it really made me realize why we need all these gears. Yeah. I mean, when you were going up a really steep, knotty hill, you need gear one. Yeah. You need it. There's a time and a season for gear one. But you don't want to be stuck in gear one. <laughs> you're not, you're not going to get too far. You're going to get tired and stop mountain biking. You're not going to move forward. And that's the wisdom that the teachers try. There's a time and season for gear mm. one. But most of the time, you don't want to be in gear one. Mm. In fact, most of the time, you want to be as far away from gear one as possible so that you can keep moving. Anytime you're on flat terrain, you want to be in your highest gear possible, right? Yeah. So that is the wisdom the teacher is, is trying to invite us into. Finding the right gear. First of all, discerning what season we are in. And then finding the right gear, adjusting to the circumstance, the situation we're in. And it seems to me that the church is struggling to find the right gear mm, right now. Definitely. Um, in fact, we're, I think we're still struggling to accept the new season and time that we are in. Yeah. What, I, what, I, what I hear from a lot of people, and not just the church, and, and not just in this situation, I, our default response often when things get difficult, painful, hard, is we want to go back to the season that we were just in. Mm -hmm. But that's never an option. <laughs> we're not in that season anymore. <laughs> so adjust to the season and time that we're in and then find the right gear. That, and I'm hearing the gears grinding. You know, <laughs> I'm hearing, and that's good because we're looking. We're searching for the right gear. And brother, if, if there's literally and spiritually, <laughs> brother, if there's any wisdom that you have on, well, maybe just for yourself, mm. how you are trying to find the right gear for the time and season we find ourselves? Well, I mean, you've already made me feel better about being confused because I think, I think you've named it. This is a season of confusion and uh, that's okay. Let's, yeah. let's embrace that. Um, I know for me... Um, you know, I've been, I've been thinking a lot about Jesus' words, right? Matthew 11, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle, humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And things don't feel easy right now. They don't feel light. They feel confusing. And um, I'm not sure... This summer, I don't know for you, it wasn't as restful as it usually is f for me, at least in the ways I'm used to summer being not restful. The, not the same. No. And this fall doesn't look to be that either. And uh, I, I love those words from Jesus, but I really am finding, or I'm trying to find my way into his words here. And um, I think understanding the idea of a season of confusion is helping. It's not always going to be easy to find that rest. Um, for me walking during COVID. I've started walking a lot more, um, mostly because I don't have the energy for mountain biking and it's an easier form of exercise for me, but there's something about the slow pace and allowing yourself to, while walking, it's a reflect, reflection time, prayerful time. You can let go of some of these, that the need to have everything figured out. Um, and to be okay with the confusion. Mm -hmm. And so that's been big for me. Um, but I think just naming that it's okay to be confused, I think is going to be helpful for a lot of people. Yeah. Well, we've talked about a lot of stuff. Yeah. I mean, I'm more confused than when we started. So that's, <laughs> I mean, and I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of the people at home are as well. And I think that's, 
And, but we've named it That's Okay. We, that's Okay. This is the yes. season of confusion. Yes. And let's let the confusion do its work. I like it. Well, then let's stop there. Giddy up.